Hello, I'm JP from the Way Biblical Fellowship, and this week's Torah portion is Kiddushim, and it means Holy Ones. That's who we're supposed to be. We're supposed to be Yahuwah's Holy Ones, set apart for His purposes. Scripture tells us that friendship with the world is enmity against God. So we look at what His standards are, and we look at what the world's standards are, and how it's constantly degrading and how the two things just will not match up with one another and how we have to make a choice to walk in one camp or the other and we cannot make a choice to walk in both camps simultaneously so we look at the deception that is common in the world today the deceptions common in the christian church where people think that they don't have to be holy they don't have to be righteous because yeshua was righteous I hope you enjoy it. Okay. Right, this week's Torah portion is called Kedoshim in Hebrew. It means holy ones in English. Is that loud enough? A bit more? A bit more? Loud enough? Okay. <laughs> Ooh, that's too loud now. Okay, every week we look at the Torah, okay? Now, Torah is often translated as law, okay? But it doesn't really mean law. The Hebrew word Torah means teaching and instruction. So when people say the Torah has been done away with now, basically what they're saying is God's teaching and instruction on how we're to live has been done away with. That doesn't, doesn't make sense, okay? Now this Torah portion is called Kedushim, okay? We had a look a few weeks ago at how the Torah is structured. Now every 50th letter in the book of Genesis, every 50th letter in the book of Deuteronomy, the fourth and fifth books, first and, uh, sorry, first and last books in the Torah, every 50th letter, it spells Torah in Hebrew, okay? So there's Tav, Vav, Resh, Hey, okay? In the first book, it's supposed to be going forward. In the last book, it's supposed to be going backwards, pointing towards the middle. Second book and the fourth book, it's exactly the same. Every 50th letter, which would be impossible for us to contrive, it'd be impossible for us to do. Not impossible for the Creator to do, to encode into His Word. But again, this is pointing towards the middle. In the middle book, which we're looking at at the moment, which is Leviticus, doesn't happen, okay? Torah is not every 50 letters, but what there is is the name of God, Yod Hey Vav Hey, every seventh letter, okay? So every seven letters, which is just so much harder than doing every 50 letters having a word. Every seven letters, it spells out the name of God. And the Torah is Yahuwah's heart, okay? First letter of the Torah is a bait. The last letter is a lamid, okay? You read Hebrew from right to left. So, a uh, lamid, beit, would be lev, and it means heart. So the Torah is Yahuwah's heart. Now this Torah portion is the center of the entire Torah, okay? The very center point. This is the heart of Yahuwah's heart, okay? And what it is, is it about what it means to be holy. So Yahuwah calls us to be holy in the world, okay? He calls us to be set apart. We've got an idea of what it is to be holy, and it's not what the scriptures say it is to be holy. Yehovah says, I'm gonna call you as my people, and you are going to be different from the world, okay? The, you're not gonna look the same at all. So we're called to be separate, we're called to be set apart from the world. So what a lot of people do, okay? They'll call themselves one of Yehovah's people, but they will be exactly the same as the rest of the world, okay? They'll look exactly the same. They'll do the same things as the rest of the world, just they will apply the label to themselves of one of Yehovah's people. I'm one of God's people. I'm a Christian, okay? What we are to do is be different in the way that Yehovah says to be different, okay? We can't say that we are Christians if we don't match the description that God himself gives of what it is to be a Christian. So there's loads of groups 
all around the country, all around the world that will say, we're Christians, but they don't follow what Yehovah says to do in the Bible. So it doesn't matter whatsoever what they call themselves, okay? What matters is whether or not it matches up to scripture. So you get all sorts of different groups who say we're Christians, but what they're actually doing is they're taking the name of God and they're taking it in vain. And he says that they profane my name. My name is supposed to be holy. My name is supposed to represent something. Can I tell you what my name is supposed to represent? If you take that name and then you profane it, i.e. you make it common, you make it about what you want to do, not about what I want to do, then you profane the name, it's not holy anymore, and it is of no effect, okay? So we need to be careful that we don't do that, okay? We need to be careful that when we come to God, we follow after his ways, okay? When we come to God, we get baptized. When you're baptized, what, is it, what scripture says there is, is it's an appeal to God for a clean conscience, okay? So you, your conscience is cleansed at that point. If from that point onwards, you continue in sin, then what happens is your conscience becomes defiled again. As soon as it's been clean, it's become defiled again. An example that I heard was it's like a mikveh. Okay, a mikveh is the bath that they used to have when they went into the temple so that their flesh was uh, physically clean. Okay, now something that could make you unclean would be, say you, you touch the bit of a corpse. That would make you physically unclean. You'd be unfit to go into the temple, okay? So say you went into a mikveh, then you would become cleansed. Your flesh would become cleansed. But if you went in holding a bit of a corpse, then when you came out, instantly you would become unclean again, okay? So when we have our consciences cleansed, we need to put down the things which are defiling them because otherwise, as soon as we continue in the walk, we become defiled again, okay? So, Hasatan has convinced the world, convinced God's people that what they can do is they can be cleansed by the blood of Jesus. Okay, we use uh, his Hebrew name, Yeshua. Okay, cleansed by his blood. And then you can just go on in sin and it's absolutely fine. No consequence to it whatsoever. And Hasatan has convinced all of these different groups of people that this is the way that things are. Okay. What it does is it completely ruins Yehovah's picture of holiness. He says, look, I want these people to be my people. I want these people to dwell in my kingdom. He's not going to say to the people, okay, you can come in. You haven't changed yourself whatsoever, but you can uh, become a citizen in my kingdom. He says, no, these are the people that I want. These are the people who have been conformed to the image of my son, who walk in the way that he walked. They're the people that I want in my kingdom, okay? If you trusted somebody, you might give them the keys to your house and say, it's okay, you can come into my house. If you didn't trust them and you knew that they were a thief, then you wouldn't give them the keys to your house because you wouldn't want them in there. So you might say, okay, the people that I let into my house are these particular people who fit this criteria. But what Hasatan has done is he said, well, God's criteria they don't matter. He'll just let anyone in as long as they've prayed the prayer and asked Jesus into their hearts. Okay. But what we're going to look at in this Torah portion is what it means to be holy. We're going to look at some of the things that Yehovah says, look, I am holy. These are my standards. Okay. I want you to meet up to these standards. You don't have to meet up to these standards in order to enter into the kingdom, okay? You have to meet these standards as you walk along. You don't have to be perfect when you come to me, but what you have to do is be willing to change yourself, to submit to this process of cleansing, okay? So, verse one says, then Yehovah spoke to Moses saying, speak to all the congregation of the sons of Israel and say to them, you shall be holy, for I, Yehovah, your God, am holy. Okay? We're told that we are grafted in to Israel. Okay? So when it talks about the congregation, it's talking about us. We're grafted into Israel, which is a name for Yehovah's people. It's not a name for a country in the Middle East. He says, you shall be holy, for I am holy. 
okay? I'm, I'm going to give you these precepts here. You walk in my ways and you will become holy because I'm holy. And these things describe who I am, okay? They describe who Yeshua was when he walked the earth. He came and he gave us this perfect example of how to walk out these things. And he was holy, okay? Because the commandments that he was following were holy. Verse 3 says, Every one of you shall reverence his mother and his father, and you shall keep my Sabbaths. I am Yehovah, your God. So the first things that he says, when he says, I'm going to describe what it is to be holy. First thing he says is you shall reverence your mother and your father. Okay? Next thing he says is you will keep my Sabbaths. Now you notice at the top here, okay, I've put which one of these categories it falls into. Yeshua said, didn't he? All of the law and the prophets hangs off these two commandments. What he wasn't saying is, come up with your own way to love God. Come up with your own way to love your neighbor, and then you're fulfilling all the commandments. Now, what he was saying is, all of the commandments tell you how to do one or both of these things. Okay, so as we go through these commandments, it'll have this at the top, and it'll tell you which one it's telling you how to do. Okay, obviously, reverencing your mother and father falls into both categories. Falls into loving people as yourself, loving people as they deserve to be, but it also falls into loving Yehovah, because sometimes it's difficult, isn't it, to love your mum, love your dad, okay, in whatever circumstances. Now, you'll notice here, he says, keep my Sabbaths, okay, and it doesn't just mean keep the weekly Sabbath, okay. What it means is all of my feast days that are high Sabbaths, I want you to keep all of them. They're special, they're holy days to me. I want you to show your heart towards me to keep my days special, okay? Not do what you want to do on them. Keep them special, keep them holy to me. Verse 4 says, Do not turn to idols or make, yourself, make for yourselves molten gods. I am Yehovah, your God, okay? And you might think, well, that's an easy one, okay? Everybody can keep this. Don't turn to idols. Don't make molten gods for yourself, okay? But making an idol, making a molten god to yourself, if you fashion something in the image of God, it's not, it's not quite God. It's not God as he describes himself here. But you fashioned another god, and then you worship that god instead, okay? You're worshiping a false god, okay? You might think, okay, no one in our culture turns to idols. Anyone know anyone that's ever turned to an idol? It's not something that's done. <laughs> well, what about this? Okay, American Idol. We're going to create a new idol for the public. We're going to create something new for them to worship. Okay. Charlie mentioned this last week. They're going to have the Temple of Baal all throughout the world, 100 different locations. They're going to have the gates of Baal, and they're going to erect them, and it's going to be this fantastic thing in the pagan culture. Everyone's going to be involved. This is something that you might not think about. Okay, this is a quote from a guy called Paul Washer. He talks about an idol that pretty much everybody has set up in the corner of the room. He says, let's talk about your television. You watch things and then expect God to move. You love their off-color jokes, their humor. You find yourself laughing in wickedness. And then you want God to move in your family and move in your life. You come to the meetings and after the meetings, you go home and sit in front of a television and watch all that filth. And you're not even sensitive to the sin of it. And you expect revival. Yahuwah says these things are unacceptable. Then... What do we do? What do we show him in our hearts is the way that we think, the things that we revere. We show him that we revere the sin that's in all of these television programs. Okay. That's us saying, okay, I love God. That's us saying something with our lips. I love God. But then our hearts show we don't love God. Actually, what we love is the sin of the world. We like that. It says in Romans 1, doesn't it, that you shouldn't do these things, nor should you take pleasure in those that do them. Okay? 
Yahuwah sees our hearts. It doesn't matter what we profess with our lips. Yeshua came and said to the Pharisees, these people, they worship me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me because Yahuwah sees exactly what's going on in our hearts. He says that they worship him in vain, teaching for doctrine the commandments of men. Okay, so he's saying, look, this is my word here. This is what I want you to do. If you worship me, actually me, and not just somebody that you've given my name to, then you'll do these things. If you worship another god, a false god, an idol, then you'll teach the commandments of men. You'll teach your tradition, and you'll do that, and you'll go after this god instead of who I am. Yehovah says, no, that's not being holy to me. Okay, verse 5 says, Now when you offer a sacrifice of peace offerings to Yehovah, you shall offer it so that it may be accepted. It shall be eaten the same day you offer it and the next day. But what remains until the third day should be burned with fire. So if it is eaten at all on the third day, it is an offense. It will not be accepted. Everyone who eats it will bear his iniquity for his profane the holy thing of Yehovah. And that person shall be cut off from his people. So what's this talking about? Talking about if you bring um, a peace offering to the temple, eat it on the day that it's sacrificed or eat it in the next day. If it goes on to the third day, then it has become profane, it has become corrupt. Can you imagine some meat that you'd left out until the third day? If you then ate it in a way that you thought was honoring God, what you've done is you've taken something that has become holy when you've sacrificed it to God, and it's become profane. You're eating it in a corrupted state. You're not treating it with the reverence that it deserves. So he says, don't do this, okay? I know what, know what you like, don't do this. Verse nine says, now when you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not reap to the very corners of your field, nor shall you gather the gleanings of your harvest, nor shall you glean your vineyard, nor shall you gather the fallen fruits of your vineyard. You shall leave them for the needy and for the stranger. I am Yehovah your God. Okay, so they had fields that they would harvest during the year. They were to leave a bit of the field so that the poor people in the land could come and gather what they needed. Okay, and Yehovah says, look, follow my commandments because if you're following my commandments, there won't even be any poor in the land. Okay, nobody will be needy. Nobody will be without because I've designed the perfect system to compensate for this. Okay. Verse 11 says, you shall not steal, nor deal falsely, nor lie to one another. Okay. Everybody probably agrees with, don't steal. Don't deal falsely with each other. When something arises and you think the easiest way to deal with this would be to tell a lie about it, to deal falsely with it, to deceive the other person, he's saying, no, my holy people who are going to be different from all the other people on the earth, they're not going to deal with things in this way. Okay? And I'm not talking about, you might have stereotypical view of people like this. Okay, you might think they probably tell quite a lot of lies. It's probably a part of their life, this idea of deception. Okay, Yehovah says, okay, I'm not just talking about your own morality, what you say is right and wrong. Okay, anyone ever told a lie in a situation like this? Okay, anyone ever gone for a job interview and told a lie in order to get it? What that amounts to is saying, I don't trust Yehovah. Okay, I don't trust this to be a good way to do things. Okay, I'm going to put my own will above his and I'm going to decide in this situation, it's okay for me to lie. Oh, if I get this job, I'll be able to do this good thing or that good thing or you know, whatever justification comes to mind. Yahuwah says, no, I've got an exacting standard. I want you to be holy, completely holy to me. He's not going to trust people in his kingdom who go about telling lies in order to benefit themselves. He says, this, these are not the people that I want. What about in this situation? Okay, pulled over for speeding. Okay, the police officer asked you how fast you were going. It's tempting to lie. Definitely tempting to lie, isn't it? Yeah, verse says, no. <laughs> okay, don't do that. This is the change that I want in you. I'm not saying everybody is going to be perfect all of the time. What I'm saying is that it must be in your heart to recognize that these things are wrong and to try and change yourself and not come up with the justification as to why it's okay to carry on in sin. 
Verse 12 says, You shall not swear falsely by my name, so as to profane the name of your God. I am Yehovah. Okay? When you say things to other people, don't use the name of Yehovah to swear and make it seem like a more solemn promise. And Yeshua actually said, Look, don't swear by anything falsely. It's not about not swearing by the name. As long as you don't swear by his name falsely, it's okay to swear by other things falsely. He should have said no. Look, what I'm trying to teach you through this is it's not okay to swear falsely. I think it's interesting that it says, I am Yehovah at the end of it, once it's talked about profaning the name, because the reason that we've got in our Bibles the Lord, or that the Jews use Hashem, which means the name, is so that they don't use this name, because they say, oh, it's too holy to use. Okay, I think Yehovah is having a bit of a laugh here, saying, don't profane my name. Then he says it out loud, as if to say, it's okay to say my name out loud, you know. It's taken out of the Bible, it's taken out of our English Bibles because of a Jewish tradition uh, where it says Hashem instead of the name yod Hey vav Hey. And that was just kind of continued in uh, our English translations. And it's uh, swapped with the Lord, uh, capital L-O-R-D. Yeah, so it's the original. The name Jesus, the name Jesus is just a transliteration, which is where you take the sound of something from one language and you try to represent it in another language. So it's taken from Hebrew. His name was a Hebrew name, it was Yeshua. And it was taken into Greek. Now in Greek, there is no um, Y sound. So the closest that they had was I-E. There's no Sh sound in Greek either. So the closest that they had was a hard S sound, okay? And the last letter of male names in Greek is always an S. So you go from Yeshua to Eusus. Then when you take it from Greek into English, it becomes Jesus. But his name originally was Yeshua. It's not offensive to use the name Jesus. It's just, it wasn't his name. Okay, verse 13 says, You shall not oppress your neighbor nor rob him. The wages of a hired man are not to remain with you all night until morning. Okay? I think we can all agree that oppressing your neighbor, robbing him is a bad thing, but this, the wages of a hired man are not to remain with you all night until morning. If somebody has done a job and you owe them some money, make sure that you go and pay them the money. You don't know if they are relying on the money. And of course, this is, this is applicable to many other situations as well. If somebody is relying on something, okay, don't withhold it from them just in order to benefit yourself. Verse 14 says, You shall not curse a deaf man, nor place a stumbling block before the blind. You shall revere your God. I am Yehovah. Okay? I don't think it's talking about situations like this. Obviously, doing this wouldn't be a good thing to do. But in the scriptures, it talks about deafness and blindness in a spiritual way. Okay? If someone is spiritually deaf, if someone is spiritually blind... Okay, and it talks about stumbling blocks. It says that a stumbling block is to be disobedient to the word. So if somebody is deaf, if somebody is blind towards something, don't put them in a situation where they're going to sin because of their deafness, because of their blindness. Okay? It's part of caring for the people around you. Verse 15 says, You shall do no injustice in judgment. You shall not be partial to the poor, nor defer to the great, but you are to judge your neighbor fairly. Okay, so don't be partial to someone just because they're poor. Don't pervert justice in order to do something for someone who is poor that is not right. Okay, so this guy, big hero in the culture. Everybody loves Robin Hood. Everyone thinks, oh yeah, the idea of stealing from the rich and giving to the poor, that's kind of fair, isn't it? Yahweh says, don't do that, okay? Don't do this, okay? If somebody's rich, then don't pervert justice in order to benefit them. Do what is right in every case, no matter who it is you're dealing with. Verse 16 says, You shall not go about as a slanderer among your people, and you are not to act against the life of your neighbor. I am Yehovah. Okay, so going about, spreading gossip, spreading slander about people, saying negative things about people, 
that's not something that Yehovah wants in his kingdom. He says, okay, those sort of people, I don't want anything to do with them. I find it evil, okay? He lists these things as part of the seven things that he hates. He says, I hate these things. Definitely don't want these things as part of my kingdom. So what are we to do? We're to bring ourselves in conformance with these things. Yeah. No, no. Yehovah says, vengeance is mine. Leave it in my hands. Verse 17 says, you shall not hate your fellow countrymen in your heart. You shall surely reprove your neighbor, but shall not incur sin because of him. Okay, so what's the problem here? Problem is hating somebody inside. Okay, when you when you've got those feelings of anger, when you've got those feelings of hatred inside, what you're to do, it says here, you shall surely reprove that person. You go to them and tell them what the problem is because what's gonna be the outcome there, okay? You might go to them, you find, actually, I can't verbalize what it is that's the problem. If you can't say what the problem is to them, then perhaps it's not fair to be hating them in, in your heart, in secret, okay? You might go to them and say, I've got this problem. And they say, you've got it all, all wrong. Okay, you've misunderstood something. And they might give you a piece of information that unless you'd actually gone and spoken to them, then you would have been lack, lacking. You wouldn't have been able to work it out. Or they might turn around and say, do you know what? I'm sorry, I shouldn't have done that. Okay, and then there's reconciliation in the situation. But Yehovah says, okay, don't hold it in your heart. Don't hate somebody because that is going to cause destruction. It's going to cause death. That is the area in which Hasatan can work, can turn you against other people. You shall not take vengeance, but, uh, nor bear any grudge against the sons of your people. Okay, so you're to go and speak to them about it. You're not to take vengeance on them. You're not to take revenge over something. And you're not to hold a grudge inside and hate them forever. Because Yehovah says, that's not going to work, is it? Okay, people are going to offend each other. What I want you to do is go and speak to the person. Have it out with them. Find a resolution. And then the last bit of it says, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am Yehovah. Okay, when Yeshua was asked, what is the most important commandment in all the scriptures? He said, uh, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. He said, the second is like unto it, love your neighbor as yourself. But he wasn't just coming up with these things as this is a new religion that I want you to follow. These are commandments that are found in the Torah as well. Okay, so how does Yehovah want us to love our neighbor as ourself? We break it down. To love someone, we've got to judge them in righteousness. All of this nonsense about the, the word saying, don't judge other people, that's really, really out of context. It's saying, don't judge other people hypocritically. Don't judge them for something that you're doing. But in order to love someone, we have to judge in righteousness so that we can rescue them from the position, the dangerous position that they're in. So we should not judge according to the outward appearance. We're told that in scripture. And we should not judge hypocritically. That's the bit where people get it wrong, where it says, judge not lest, lest ye be judged. Okay, it then goes on to give the context of that's doing it hypocritically. Okay, uh, remove the log from your own eye before you remove the speck from your neighbors. But it is essential to make righteous judgments in order to edify our neighbor and help them where they need help. Okay, Yehovah says, I want my people to be like this. Now, if we love somebody, Okay, we're going to make sure that they are one of Yehovah's people, that they are walking in the ways of righteousness, that they end up being one of the people that he gives eternal life to and he invites into his kingdom. We must look past both our neighbor's external shows of piety and his or her outward facades to the spiritual reality that lies beneath. Okay, it's easy to put on a show of piety, to put on a show of religiousness. Okay. We need to look past that, look at the spiritual reality that lies beneath it and judge on that. Now, it might be difficult if you see the spiritual reality that lies beneath 
okay? And you see that there's a problem there. The easiest thing to do might be to just ignore it, to let them get on with it, okay? But the most loving thing to do is to love them as Yahuwah would and point it out to them in a loving way to edify them, to build them up, to bring them back to a place of restoration. Proverbs 9, 8 to 9 says, Reprove not a scorner, lest he hate thee. Rebuke a wise man, and he will love thee. Okay? So, we've got to be wise in this. If somebody is not walking with God, and they're going to just hate you for speaking the truth to them, it's not worth talking to them. It's not worth rebuking a scorner, because all that you're going to have then is a situation where they despise you, because they're not willing to change so in you speaking to them, it's not going to do any good. All that it's going to do, in fact, is create harm. But if you speak to someone who is wise, somebody who loves God, and you point out something that is an error, then they will love you because of it, because they will realize that you're bringing them back on the path to restoration. Give instruction to a wise man, and he will be yet wiser. Teach a just man, and he will increase in learning. So this is loving our neighbor, okay? You do not truly love your neighbor if you do not rebuke him or her when he or she is wrong. If you choose to do the easy thing, you choose basically to love yourself in that situation, then that's not loving your neighbor, okay? It's loving who you are, loving what you're about. Tolerating sinful attitudes and actions from your neighbor and saying nothing about it is to hate, not to love them. And not rebuking someone it's not about loving them, it's about loving yourself, okay? We can, we can kind of con ourselves, can't we, and say, oh, well, it, it, it's not loving to say something in this situation, it's going to make them feel bad. An example that I heard was, uh, again, the guy from before, Paul Washer, he was saying, we went to the doctor, I went to the doctor with my mum, and the doctor told her that she had cancer, and it hurt my mum. It made my mum cry. She wasn't happy, okay? But in telling her that she had cancer, it gave her the chance then to do something about it. If we see something in someone else that's sinful, that we know is going to destroy them ultimately, that they're walking away from Yehovah, and we don't identify that thing to them, and we don't warn them about it, then it's not being loving towards them. Unconditional love is not unconditional tolerance, which is kind of what it's become in our society. Okay, just tolerating all of these things. That's what being loving is. It's love that emulates Yehovah's love unconditionally. Okay, whatever the situation is that arises, it's emulating his love and showing people, okay, this is the right way, this is the wrong way, even when it's difficult. Okay, it's definitely unconditional tolerance is unconditional hate, hatred of the people and love of yourself and just making your world run smoothly, not worrying about how their world runs. 2 Samuel 12, 13 to 14 gives us an example of someone being rebuked in scripture, okay, saying something hard to someone. And Dan, uh, David said to Nathan, I have sinned against Jehovah. And Nathan said to David, Jehovah hath put away thy sin, thou shalt not die. Howbeit, because by this deed thou hast given great occasion to the enemies of Yehovah to blaspheme, the child also that is born unto thee shall surely die. So he didn't take the easy way. He didn't say, oh, it's fine, don't worry about it. Your sin will be forgiven. He said, what you've done in this case is you've given the enemies of Yehovah a way to blaspheme his name. Okay, you've, you've done something so that they can look at you and say, this is a man of Yehovah. Okay, this is what Yehovah is about. Okay, Yehovah is nothing before us. So he warns him exactly of what he's done, exactly what he's achieving. Verse 19 says, You are to keep my statutes. You shall not breed together two kinds of your cattle. You shall not uh, sow your field with two kinds of seed, nor wear a garment upon you of two kinds of material mixed together. Okay, I'll get to this bit, to the mistranslation in a second. But he says, You shall not breed together two kinds of your cattle. Now what do we have in the world, okay, that we're to be holy, to be separate from? Okay, we've got interbreeding of different species together. We've got the genetic modification. 
Okay. Obviously, oh, in Joshua 4.18, just to show you that this is not a new thing, okay, this was happening before the flood as well. Okay, this is a historical account of before the flood. It says, and their judges and rulers went to the daughters of men and took their wives by force from their husbands according to their choice. And the sons of men in those days took the cattle of the earth, the beasts of the field and the fowls of the air and taught the mixture of animals of one species with the other. Okay, so we've got a historical record that this was going on. This can't have made much sense to people before about 30 years ago. They were mixing animals together, one species with another. How does that work? Okay. Men have um, morality. Men have what they think is right, what they think is wrong. Now, I put up this picture to show you. Obviously, this is a joke. This is an, uh, an animal hybrid, okay? But some people would think that it was okay to create things like this. Some people would think that it wasn't, okay? But the point is, the men's morality is not the dividing line. Yehovah gives us absolute truth. He gives us the dividing line. Don't do this, do the other, okay? This is one that perhaps people would think, definitely, definitely don't think that they should create something like this. Most people would probably sway in that direction. There are some people though in the world that would think, that'd be cool, let's go out and make him. Obviously we'll keep them in cages and we won't let them out into the world, but it, it's fine to make them, you know, but it's just science, isn't it? It's just the progress of science. Well, this is the thing. Men have a completely different idea of what right and wrong is to God. The only way that we can actually have this anchor to what truth is, is by going according to his word. Okay? This is a real picture. Okay? This is something that is called a liger. Okay? We've had to look at this before. This is a cross between a lion and a tiger. Okay? Oh, I've got a video here that will show you the lie. I'm going to tell you a little bit about what it's about. Okay. Dr. Bhagavan Anta runs the Institute of Greatly Endangered and Rare Species in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. He successfully combined two species to produce hybrid offspring called ligers. The laws of nature apply to big cats as well as primates. Genetically, ligers are 50% tiger and 50% lion. Here on my right, we have a Bengal tiger. She's about a year and a half old, and she's got that bold black and orange striping. And then on my left, we have a young lion about the same year and a half old. So you can see it has a much more tawny tail coat. And obviously, the mix of the two right here, with the shadow striping and his bold markings, show us the liger. He's a liger because his father is a lion, his mother a tiger. That's the video. Now meet the adult. If you haven't come across a fully grown liger before, then this is the largest cat you're ever likely to see. Is it all right for us to do that, or is it not? Some people would say that that's fine. You know, I'm sure that you can come up with noble-sounding justifications of why we should. It was natural breeding. It's just it wouldn't happen in nature. It wouldn't happen naturally. It, they, they've done it in captivity. Sorry. No. 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 It, they, 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 yeah. It, in captivity, though, and they've kind of they've created this situation. With him, I've not seen it. Yeah. 
sure, you know, because uh, when God created the different species, yeah. they will have intercourse with their own species. Yeah, yeah, that's the way that it's meant to be. And Yahuwah says, keep it, keep it that way. Don't, don't be crossing the same kind yeah. together. I, I know that they did. Uh, I, I haven't seen them doing it, so I'm not sure <laughs> on the details. But uh, the, it, it was uh, them breeding together. It wasn't, you know, uh, genetic manipulation. Although they do do genetic manipulation. It's like this. Okay, these are zebras mixed with horses. Okay, that's not how things are meant to be. Look at them. They look ridiculous. Look like weird zombie horses. Okay, you did it. the creation is beautiful. Okay, and this is what we end up with when man applies his wisdom and says, oh, well, these will technically mate together, so we'll do that and we'll have some offspring. Okay, this one is a zonkey, okay, cross between a zebra and a donkey. It just looks weird, doesn't it? it doesn't look. Yeah. They, they uh, produce another animal. Yeah. And that is intercourse. Yeah. Different species. And the new one, the new, you know, mixed race. Yeah. You know, race. It was died early. Yeah. Shoot. Yeah, that's what Joe's saying. They're, they're, uh, they're no good. I'll show you some examples now of what happens when you mix cattle together because this commandment specifically said cattle obviously Yahweh is not saying okay don't mix the cattle together but go go wild with the other animals that's fine but these are these are things that have come from men breeding things together Yehovah says, don't do this, this is an abomination before me. I'm the creator, I've created things as they should be. Don't get involved in that, basically. Okay? Some of them you might think, well, you know, that's fair enough. It's, it's just produced a bigger cow, so that's fine. Well, let, let that be done, that's justifiable. Some of them, they're a bit weird, we don't like them, okay, we'll, we'll not let people do that. And that's, again, that's man looking at these things, coming up with his own wisdom on them. Yehovah lays out these things for us. Okay? But the Christian church do it with sin. Okay? Yehovah says, break my law and it's sin. Okay? Christian church comes along and says, no, it's okay for us to do this. It's okay for us to do that. We don't do this anymore. We do this instead. Okay? And it's exactly the same. Okay? It's man looking at things, applying his wisdom to it, and denying Yehovah the authority to speak on these things. So this part of it where it says, you shall not have two kinds of material mixed together. This is common. This is common in the translations that it says two kinds of material mixed together. This is the King James translation. It says linen and woolen. Okay, it's very different to just having two different types of material mixed together. That's, you know, that's a prohibition that perhaps you wouldn't be able to understand at all. Linen and woolen, you think about the nature of those materials. Linen, okay, is something that you wear when you want to be cool. Wool, something that you wear when you want to be warm. Okay, so it wouldn't naturally make sense to wear them together anyway. But I saw some scientific research and they looked at the resonant frequency of your body and it resonates at 100, I think it's 100 hertz. Okay, linen, resonates at 5,000 hertz, 
wall resonates as well at 5,000 hertz. Now, if you've got two frequencies and they are the same, what they do is they cancel each other out. Now, when you have materials on the human body, because it's got this resonant frequency of 100, if you were things that have a lower resonance frequency than the human body, it's shown to cause um, health problems. Okay? If you wear linen and wool together, what it does is it cancels out, so it ends up equaling zero. That's really bad news for our bodies to be clothed in those things. So, in all of these things, there's wisdom. Some of them we don't understand, okay? So we just trust them and say, you're the creator, I'm going to do these things. But what mankind has done is they've come along, they've taken these things and they've said, well, we don't understand this, we don't understand that, so what we're actually going to do is we're going to cut them out of the Bible and say that we don't do them anymore, okay? Seems absurd. Verse 20 says, Now if a man lies carnally with a woman who is a slave acquired for another man, we'll come back for that, but who has in no way been redeemed, nor given her freedom, there shall be punishment. They shall not, however, be put to death because she was not free. Okay, so Yahuwah says, If there's fornication in this society amongst these holy people, then it's got to carry the death penalty. Okay, you think of the society that we live in today, if you were to just impose this and say, oh, with the death penalty for fornication, it would be ridiculous, wouldn't it? Okay, everybody would be getting killed in the society that we live in today. That's not what's going on. Yahweh is not just saying, I'm going to impose this on a pagan society. What he's saying is, these are my people, okay? And what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you laws that say, this is the death penalty for this, this is the death penalty for that. Not so that people end up getting killed, so that people understand how serious it is. These are not laws that were commonly enforced. Okay? There weren't people getting stoned to death all the time. But people knew where they stood. They knew what was right, and they knew what was wrong, because there was a penalty there. Okay? Think about fornication. Think about adultery. Think about how easy it is for us to just do these things in our society because there's no consequence. If you thought that you were going to get killed for doing it, you'd probably think a lot more seriously about doing it. And this is what Yehovah is doing. Okay, he's saying, in my kingdom, amongst my holy people who are set apart from the world, this is the standard that I've got for them. Okay? People look at things like this and they say, oh, it's not fair. Can you imagine that in society today? It just wouldn't work. Well, it's not supposed to work with our society. Okay, and this bit here where it says, who is a slave acquired for another man, it conjures up all sorts of bad images, doesn't it? Okay, but a slave, okay, this is a mistranslation into the English, or it's a miscommunication of the concept anyway. What, if somebody was a slave or a servant, what would have happened in that society is they would have reached a position where they were so destitute that they in order to get money, they had sold themselves into service for somebody else. It wasn't something where you went and you captured slaves and you took them against their will. It was when somebody sold themselves into service into the house of another person. Often it was when uh, somebody couldn't pay uh, a debt. Okay? They were sold into service for a specific period of time. It wasn't an indefinite thing. It wasn't you're a slave forever. Okay, it would be you're in the service of someone else. So this is what this is talking about here. Not slavery as we think about it, where they went off to Africa and they brought a load of people against their will in order to serve them forever against their will. Completely different concept. Okay, this is a voluntary thing that people would do. He shall bring his guilt offering to Yehovah to the doorway of the tent of meeting, a ram for a guilt offering, the priest shall also make atonement for him with the ram of the guilt offering before Yehovah for his sin which he has committed, and the sin which he has committed will be forgiven him. Now to explain something here, when it's talking about your sins being forgiven, it's not talking about in front of Yehovah, okay? It's talking about you've paid whatever the fine was, and now in the physical realm, in the human world, you have been forgiven of the thing that you've done wrong. It's not talking about your sin being forgiven before uh, Yehovah. The only thing that can cause forgiveness of sin before Yehovah is the blood of the Savior. Okay, people get this mixed up and they say, well, your sins were forgiven one way by the law in the past, 
now they're forgiven in a different way through the blood of Yeshua, so we don't need the, uh, we don't need the law anymore. Okay, different sort of forgiveness that this is talking about here, the human realm to the heavenly realm. Verse 23 says, When you enter the land and plant all kinds of trees for food, you shall count their fruit as forbidden. Three years it shall be forbidden to you. It shall not be eaten, but in the fourth year all its fruit shall be holy, an offering of praise to Yehovah. In the fifth year you are to eat of its fruit, that its yield may increase for you. I am Yehovah, your God. So when you go into the land, this holy land, I want you to treat it as holy. When you plant the fruit trees in the holy land, follow this procedure. And it tells us why. It says that its yield may increase for you. There's something about following this procedure that causes the yield of these trees to increase. Okay? So... Yeah, uh, I don't know. I reckon some people will do that in Israel. Well, it's, it's blossoming because of like man-made uh, changes, basically. What's happening in Israel at the moment is nothing to do with God. It's to do with uh, the Zionists who are kind of funding this state into being. Okay, people think that you know, Israel, it's God's country, they're God's people. Okay, in the Bible it says, these are not the children of God. They are the children of the flesh. The ones who are counted as the children of God are the children of the promise. Okay, and they're the people who have faith in God. It says in Romans 11 that they are the natural branches who have been cut off. Okay, it says that they can be grafted back into Messiah, but at the moment they're cut off. And it says, uh, be careful lest you're cut off as well. If the natural branches can be cut off, then you can be cut off as well. Okay. So what's going on in Israel? Nothing to do with God. It's to do with man-made technology. That's kind of what's causing the desert to blossom. It's all of the, um, what's it called? The irrigation systems and stuff like that that they put in. When it describes in the Bible that the land will blossom again, it says that it's a move of Yehovah. And all the way through scripture, uh, we see that Yehovah blesses the land and he brings abundance out of the land. It's nothing to do with men using technology in order to make it bloom, in order to make it blossom. Okay. Okay. Verse 26 says, You shall not eat anything with the blood, nor practice divination or soothsaying. Okay, so this isn't talking about if you have a steak, don't have it rare. Okay, what's in a steak is myoglobin. It's not blood, it's red but it's not blood. Okay, this is talking about pagan practices where they would drink blood, where they would eat the animal with blood in a bloody state. It's not, not talking about our meat today. But this where it says here, no practice divination. Okay, this is something that applies to me personally. Before I was a Christian, I used to do something called the I Ching or the Yi Jing. Okay, it's where you cast three, it's often done with three coins. Okay, and what you do is you look at the combination that comes up, heads or tails, okay? Uh, heads would be worth three, tails would be worth two, so you get a number from the three coins between six and nine. You get a hexagram, okay? You might get moving lines, depending on if you get a six or a nine, it shows some, some transition in the situation that you're talking about, okay? You get a couple of different hexagrams. This is the situation as it is now. This is the situation as it's moving to. And it's a form of divination. It's a form of man looking into a realm that he shouldn't be looking at at all. Okay, and Yehovah says, don't be involved in any of those things. Okay, this is another thing that I used to do. Okay, tarot cards. Okay, and it does seem that there is tremendous power in these things. When I used to do this, it used to work. Okay, it's not like it doesn't work, and that's why Yehovah says, "Don't do these things." Okay, if it was just a waste of time, if it didn't work, Yehovah probably wouldn't be bothered about it. Okay, but this is communication with demonic spirits. Okay, you'll see here. Okay, you've got the pentagram. Okay, it's it's facing the other way up, and people say, "Well, if it's upside down, then it's evil, and if it's facing the right way, then it's good." No, it's all occultic knowledge. I think that this one's an interesting card, okay, called the judgment. There's an angel with a trumpet and the dead are rising out of their graves and it's called the judgment. And often you'll find with these spiritual streams is that they will have some 
kernel of truth to them. Okay? It will be biblical in some way. It will sound like it's biblical. It will sound like it's of God. But what it actually is, is a complete perversion. The thing is turning itself on its head. Okay, so all of this sort of stuff, the old bar says, don't be involved with. The Ouija board, okay? We perhaps identify this as evil. They used to sell this in toy shops, okay? But now it's been made illegal to do that. Again, what's that, sorry? Now this, okay, we look at this, and it looks a bit evil. It looks a bit wrong, doesn't it? This is how they're marketing it now. Okay, marketing, just marketing it to kids again. Okay, oh, it's pink, it's all bright, it looks good. This is the way that Hasatan comes to people. Okay, some people he will come to and he will give them the evil Ouija board and say, Come and do this, this, is, this will be exciting. Some people he will come to like this and they'll say, Oh, there's no harm in it, it's just for the kids, and, you know, nothing really demonic about it. Okay, so he will tailor the deception for you personally okay just because we don't look at something and say that is inherently evil the only way that we can actually see whether it's right or wrong is by having that anchor to god's word verse 27 says you shall not round off the side growth of your heads nor harm the edges of your beard this is this is why you get these uh, jewish people who've got the big ringlets coming out and they've got the big beards and stuff and People say, oh, so if you follow the Torah, can you not have a shave? That's not what it's talking about, right? You'll notice that it says, you shall not harm the edges of your beard. Okay, this is a clue as to what it's talking about. We see more fully in the next verse, it says, you shall not make any cuts in your body for the dead, nor tattoo marks on yourselves. I am Yahuwah. All of this... No, no, no. All of this is um, a pagan practice to do with the dead. So it's talking about they used to shave their heads in mourning for the dead. They used to uh, harm the edges, of, mar the edges of the beard, you know, destroy it, make it look uh, unkempt in order um, to honor the dead. Same with this, making cuts in your body. You see this in Islam where they'll cut their body and they'll uh, have the blood pouring and stuff. Tattoos, again, it's talking about for the dead. Don't get a tattoo in order to honor the dead because all of these were pagan practices. He says, I want you to be holy. Don't do all of these things, okay? This is just nonsense that the pagans do. It's all superstition, basically. Don't do these things. I want you to be holy to me. Sorry? Repent? That's the thing. Yehovah isn't going to hold anything about your past against you. He will forgive you of all of your sin. What he asks though is that you repent, you turn from doing those things so that you don't do them again. Then he'll give you forgiveness. Verse 29 says, Do not profane your daughter by making her a harlot so that the land will not fall to harlotry and the land become full of lewdness. Okay? Distinct warning here. Now you might think, well, I'm not going to make my daughter a harlot, okay, so the land becomes full of lewdness. Yeah, yeah. What about this? This is common in our culture, isn't it? Okay, the land has become full of lewdness. It's become a disgusting place to live, okay? It's everything that we are surrounded with and again according to our human wisdom we might be able to justify some of these things we might be able to justify a slide towards this Yahweh says no you're going to be holy to me I don't want you to be involved in any of this stuff because it's going to create a society that's in a state of disrepair it's going to create a society where there's all of this destruction okay Verse 30 says, You shall keep my Sabbaths and revere my sanctuary. I am Yahuwah. And put at the top, obviously, I've identified this is how we love Yahuwah. Okay? When we say, I love God, okay? Charlie's given an example before of people saying, I love fish. Okay? If you say, I love fish, it doesn't mean that you go out and you, you rescue fish and you take them to other places where they're going to be happier or make a, a wildlife reserve for them so that the fish are dead good. It means what I like to do is I like to kill the fish and cut it up and stick it in my mouth, okay? 
that's not really loving fish, is it? That's loving ourselves, okay? So when we say, I love God, tend to do the same thing. Doesn't mean I love God, as in how God wants to be loved, they're the things that I do. It means I quite like having God as part of my life, okay? I, I like to be able to say that I'm one of God's people. I like the idea that I'll die and I'll go to paradise, okay? Again, it's nothing to do with loving God though, okay? What it's to do with is the fact that, in fact, we love ourselves. Wow, isn't my life so much better with the, the idea that I can include God in it, okay? That's not loving God. What do you mean? Well, the thing is, we have a way where we think we love God and we think that it means in our hearts if we have this emotional feeling of attachment to something then that's what love is Yehovah says no if you love me if you actually love who I really am then you'll do these things because you'll love these things okay now as I say it's not about the case of being perfect before God of just instantly being transformed what it's a case of is submitting yourself to the process and not throwing up a blockage and saying I'm unprepared to change in this way okay if you say okay I will change and I'll submit to the process I'll be changed slowly that's fine that's all that God is looking for he's not looking for people to be perfect instantly he's looking for people to look at his word and hunger and thirst after the righteousness that's contained within it and go after these things and conform themselves to them Verse 31 says, Do not turn to mediums or spiritists. Do not seek them out to be defiled by them. I am Yehovah your God. Okay, this is what he says will happen if we go to mediums. If we go to spiritists, he says that you will be defiled by them. You will be made unclean by going to them. Spiritually, you'll be made unclean because these people commune with spirits. Now, they might say to you that it's a good spirit that they're communicating with, but it's not. It's always a deception. Again, Hasatan isn't going to come as someone evil. He's going to come in a form that you think is good, and he's going to slowly suck you into doing things that Yehovah says is wrong. Okay. Hasatan, sorry, um, Satan. Uh, in the Hebrew, it's not a name, okay? Uh, it's Hasatan. Ha, meaning the. Satan meaning adversary or slanderer. So it just means the accuser, the enemy. Okay, we have kind of turned it into a name and we use the name Satan. Okay, but it's not actually what it says in the Bible. It says the accuser or the enemy. And so Hasatan is what we say because that's, that's what, the, uh, what the Bible says. So again, again, you look at something like this and we might think, well, it's kind of suggestive that it's evil isn't it you know she's got a snake on the go here and you know, she doesn't look like a very holy person so we might identify this as wrong okay we might openly be able to identify it as wrong but like you're saying you might go to somebody who says oh no i'm i'm seeking after god instead and they might be dressed all uh, righteously and holy and they might have the outward appearance that they are seeking god they might be deceived into thinking, I'm seeking God. But Yehovah says, don't do these things. And that is, that is the only way that we know if it's right or if it's wrong, because Hasatan will come and try to deceive us. And we are susceptible to those things, to make judgments for ourselves about what's right and what's wrong. The only way that we can be sure is by following his word. Things like this, okay, it might seem like just a bit of fun. Okay, you go into a seance, it's just a bit of fun, isn't it? Okay, Yehovah says, don't be involved in these things. The number of times that I've heard people say, I've been to a seance and they, they told me something that absolutely nobody could know apart from this person. Okay, and it's just a deception. It's the spirit who has obviously observed these things, going to this person and whispering in their ear, tell them about this, tell them about that. There's no one that could have known apart from this particular person or a spirit 
who has this information, who has this knowledge and is able then to share it with the medium. The medium says it to the other person. The other person then thinks that there's such a thing as speaking to spirits from the dead and all the rest of it. Deception is promulgated to it. So Yehovah says, no, don't do it. You're holy to me. Stay separate, stay apart from all of that. Verse 32 says, you shall rise up before the gray-headed and honor the aged and shall revere your God uh, revere your God, I am Yehovah. Okay? This word, grey-headed, okay? it's not talking about somebody who's just got some grey hair. What it's talking about is somebody who's got fine, like fine white hair, fine grey hair, somebody who is to be respected, somebody who is aged. Okay? Not, not sure, Charlie. <laughs> you, you're on the boundary. <laughs> Exactly, exactly. We might not agree with them, but we're to show them respect. Always to show them respect. Hey, verse 33 says, When a stranger resides with you in your land, you shall not do him wrong. The stranger who resides with you shall be as the native among you, and you shall love him as yourself. And you are strangers in the land of Egypt. I am Yehovah your God. See, the Torah doesn't just say, love your neighbor as yourself. It says, love your neighbor, love the stranger, love your enemies, love them all as yourself, okay? Stranger is actually one of the categories of people that Yehovah says to particularly look out for. He says, the widows, the poor, the orphans, and the strangers, because they all lack some degree of protection, okay? The poor, they haven't got much money, okay? So look after them. Somebody who's a widow hasn't got a husband, so look after them. Somebody who is an orphan, hasn't got parents, look after them. Someone who's a stranger doesn't have the protection of knowing the people around them. There's a little bit of uncertainty there. So Yehovah says, look after these people particularly. Verse 35 says, you shall do no wrong in judgment, in measurement of weight or capacity. You shall have just balances, just weights, a just ephah and a just hin. I am Yehovah your God, who brought you out from the land of Egypt. Okay, so basically... If you're selling something to somebody, okay, and they say, I want a, a, a kilogram of sugar, don't get out a weight that weighs 800 grams, but that says one kilogram on it, put it on the scale, and then measure out, um, measure out 800 grams instead of a kilogram, okay? It's saying, be honest in all of your dealings, okay? Obviously, this doesn't just apply to, don't, don't sell people stuff that doesn't weigh the right amount. Okay, that's not what Yahweh is saying. He's saying when you deal with people, deal honestly, deal fairly, deal above board. Verse 37 says, You shall thus observe all my uh, statutes and my ordinances and do them. I am Yahweh. Okay, so he rounds off by saying, If you're going to be holy to me, okay, the way that you do it is by observing all of my statutes and all my ordinances. Because you know what? The world around you isn't going to do all of these things. The way that you mark yourself out is different. The way that you mark yourself out is mine. You've got to take my name and represent it. Do these things. Okay, chapter 20. It's only 17 verses, but I thought that, that was an appropriate time to take a break. Okay, so verse 1 says, Then Yehovah spoke to Moshe, saying, You shall also say to the sons of Israel, any man from the sons of Israel or from the aliens sojourning in Israel who gives any of his offspring to Moloch shall surely be put to death. Okay, Moloch was um, a pagan deity and what they would do is they would give their children to Moloch in that Moloch would be represented by a bronze statue and he'd have his hands out. They'd have a fire under the bronze statue and they'd heat up the bronze statue until it was glowing red. And then what they'd do is they'd put the babies in the hands of the statue and the babies would burn up. Okay, that, that's what giving your children to Moloch is. Is there any man from the sons of Israel or from the aliens sojourning in Israel who gives any of his offspring to Moloch shall be put to death. The people of the land shall stone him with stones. Again, this isn't about let's have loads of stonings all the time. This is about Yehovah saying, look, this is unacceptable. If you're going to be my people, this isn't going to be accepted by me. It's going to carry the death penalty so you know exactly where you stand on the issue. 
I will also set my face against that man and I will cut him off from among his people because he has given some of his offspring to Moloch so as to defile my sanctuary and to profane my holy name. If the people of the land, however, should ever disregard that man when he gives any of his offspring to Moloch so as not to put him to death, then I will set myself against that man and against this family and I will cut off from among the people both him and all those who play the harlot after him by playing the harlot after Moloch. I think we can all agree, giving your kids to Moloch is a pretty evil thing, okay? But they still worship Moloch today. This is uh, a place called the Bohemian Grove in America. Okay, and this is a ritual that's called the creation of care. And is they don't, at this ceremony, I don't know what happens afterwards when they have a big three-day festival where basically at the beginning of it they have this the cremation of care they forget about all their cares and then they go off in smaller groups into the woods and i have absolutely no idea what they do they do burn an effigy yeah you know about this don't you james martin you're aware of uh, bohemian grove and about the people who were involved in it you'll probably recognize some of the names on this list yeah, they're all members of Bohemian Grove. Now, it used to be that the, um, the presidency before this, a lot of the people that were surrounding George Bush would be much more heavily involved in this. It seems that there's been a, way from, a move away from kind of overt Satanism like this in the um, Obama administration. But it still goes on. It's just not as overt. But yeah, these are some pretty well-known names okay especially in the george bush administration okay but these are the people who were involved in these things these are the people who would actually be there at the cremation of care when they had the effigy floating down the river with the human screams being played out of the speakers okay these are the people who are in charge of our world this is a picture as well from bohemian grove okay this is a black child who has been struck down okay don't know what's what's going on here okay but it doesn't look very good and these are the official pictures that have been released by bohemian grove when uh, it started to be uncovered what went on there they thought right okay damage limitation we'll release some we'll release some pictures okay and they just basically say oh we're just uh, a load of blokes getting together having a laugh you know there's nothing nothing evil or twisted or sinister about it but really you can't deny that there's something pretty malevolent going on there isn't there okay we might think well in today's society we don't like the people of the land don't sacrifice to Moloch okay this is what they used to do they used to give their babies up to Moloch but we do kill human babies okay instead of it being offered up to Moloch the sacrifice nowadays is offered up to the God of self okay it's inconvenient for me to have a baby so what i'm going to do is i'm going to have my baby killed okay it's offering up our children again it's an abomination in the sight of yehovah and he says my people my people aren't going to be involved in any of this verse 6 says as for the person who turns to mediums and to spiritists to play the harlot after them i will also set my face against this people um, against this person, sorry, and will cut him off from among his people, okay? This is Yehovah saying that he will do this, okay? He, some of the things he says, right, I want you to institute this punishment. Some of the things he says, I will bring this about. I will cut him off from his people. And we'll see more examples of that in a bit. He says, you shall consecrate yourselves, therefore, and be holy, for I am Yehovah your God. You shall keep my statutes and practice them. I am Yehovah who sanctifies you. He says that we're to be a light to the nations. Okay, we're to be holy, we're to be set apart, we're to be sanctified. So when they look at us and they observe us keeping all of these things, okay, it says in Deuteronomy, they look and they say, what nation is it that has a God as righteous as this, that has decrees as righteous as these? And they see the benefit of living by these things and they glorify his name as opposed to them looking at Christians today and they just think, that, that God's a joke. We want nothing to do with that God whatsoever. These Christians are hypocrites, okay? They don't practice what they preach, 
okay? They've got no kind of um, standard by which they follow, okay? They basically make it up as they go along, okay? And it's because they have left all of this behind. They've left Yehovah's law behind. They said that it's been done away with, so they've taken the standard of holiness. And they've thrown it away, so we've got absolutely nothing to judge by. Now, Christians will say, okay, some of the commandments, some of them we'll still keep, okay? Like the idea of don't get a tattoo, okay? Christians will say, don't get a tattoo. It says in the Bible not to get a tattoo. Well, where does it say it in the Bible? Okay, it says it in his law. So you can't have the bits of his law that you want and then ignore the rest of it. And it's completely out of context anyway, okay? Verse nine says, if there is anyone who curses his father or his mother, he shall surely be put to death. He has cursed his father or his mother. His blood guiltiness is upon him. Again, this is Yehovah establishing the standard of what is acceptable and what is not acceptable. It's not about killing people. But Yeshua said, he said that this is the right standard. He said to the Pharisees, okay, Moses said that you should honor your father and mother and if you curse your father or mother, then you should be put to death. But you, from your own tradition, you've said that if somebody says, I've devoted myself to God, so I don't have to worry about my parents anymore, then they will go free. They, can, they are allowed to do that. It's a loophole to the law. He says, you have established your own tradition and you've made, nullified the word of God. So we have actually got a part in scripture where Yeshua says, okay, you should be stoning these people, but you've nullified the word of God by your own tradition. So none of this has changed, okay? Jesus didn't come along and say, oh, this law that I gave you, okay, when you came out of Egypt, forget about that, that's, you know, that's a load of bother, don't, don't worry about doing that, okay? I'll give you something new, just, just love each other and make sure you love God and you, you go to church and you do this and that and the other. That's kind of the religion that we've got, isn't it? That's what's preached in most of the pulpits around the country, okay? It's going back to stuff like this where we can see the people that we're supposed to be. Verse 10 says, if there is a man who commits adultery with another man's wife, one who commits adultery with his friend's wife, the adulterer and the adulteress shall surely be put to death. Can you imagine if this was the standard that we live by in this society? Okay, it's just become acceptable. People aren't holy, they're profane. Okay, the nations are in a ridiculous state now and it's fallen so far that we've reached the point where Yeshua is gonna come back and he's gonna judge the nations because it's got as bad as it can get. Okay, this is the standard that we need to return to. Okay, this is, this is an actual website that exists. Okay, life is short, have an affair. That sounds great. Yeah. No, no, no. It, it's basically it's it's a dating website for people who are married. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I do know the Yahuwah isn't going to be happy with this. All the people who've been on Ashley Madison aren't going to be before him and go, oh, that's great there. It's a bit of a laugh. Verse 11 says, if there is a man who lies with his father's wife, he has uncovered his father's nakedness. Both of them shall surely be put to death. Their blood guiltiness is upon them. If there is a man who lies with his daughter-in-law, both of them shall surely be put to death. They have committed incest, their blood guiltiness is upon them. Now, our society thinks that stuff like this is a bit wrong. Yehovah says, if anyone does it, they should be put to death. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. The soaps are just a way, basically, of acclimatizing people to sin, making things seem acceptable. There's the homosexual agenda, isn't there? Yeah. 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 
Yeah, I mean, what's right and what's wrong, and then you get a highly emotive story about some, something that happens to, uh, Charlie was talking about it last week, something that happens to a gay couple, and it makes you feel really sorry for them, and it makes you, you think that being gay is actually all right, and you're moving all the way, uh, all the time away from what God says is right. Verse 13 says, If there is a man who lies with a male as those who lie with a woman, both of them have committed a detestable act, they shall surely be put to death. Their blood guiltiness is upon them. You know, God doesn't want these people dwelling in his kingdom. He says that it's wrong. Okay? <laughs> exactly. This is, the, this is what our society says. It says, oh, it's just about whether they love each other. Again, it's man saying, look, I, I can justify this. Exactly. God's love. We can justify this. It makes sense to us that if people are in love, then, you know, they should just be allowed to do whatever they want. Well, Yehovah says, not among my people. If they want to be among my people, then this is unacceptable. Okay. This is something at the moment, isn't it? Sorry? Yeah. Yeah, and it's, uh, you know, Pope Francis is the gay, gay-friendly Pope and all of the rest of the nonsense. This is going on in America at the moment. Okay, where you're allowed to use the opposite sex's bathroom if you feel in your head like you're the opposite sex. Pretty ridiculous, isn't it? Okay, so if somebody is transgender, okay, if a bloke's transgender, he can use the female bathroom. Okay, so what about this guy? Uh, do you reckon that he should be allowed in the toilet? Or do you reckon he's a pervert? Okay. Well, that, that's the way that it should be. However, in America, the way that the law is now, he can go to the bathroom uh, in the female, female bathroom. North Carolina are actually having a backlash against this at the moment, they've said that it's wrong that they shouldn't be doing it. And so loads of businesses have left North Carolina because they're not tolerant enough. Okay. What about this guy? Okay. okay. <laughs> let's, let's have a vote. The, the women, would you be comfortable with this guy using the bathroom with you? <laughs> you walk into the toilet and then this guy's standing there at the sinks. You know, would you be happy with your daughter going to the toilet in the same bathroom as this guy? Obviously not. These are things that are obviously wrong. Sorry? No, not paedophiles. I'm talking about people who are transgender. I've seen a lot of transgender people in the flesh that look like this guy. <laughs> this guy, Jason Pomer, okay, he went into the bathrooms now that they've made this the law that it's okay for you to do. And he set up a camera in the women's bathroom to watch the women using the toilet, and they found him uh, hidden in a cupboard somewhere watching them. <laughs> this is obviously going to be the result. Yehovah says, don't do this. Okay, not, not a great idea to do this. It doesn't take a lot of brain power to realize that this is going to be the sort of thing that happens. Okay? People that feel like women, should they be able to use the bathroom? Well, you know, let's weigh it up against the fact that things like this are obviously going to happen. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Exactly, and there's nothing that can be done at that stage. Okay. This is, a ga this is um, an article about paedophilia being brought in in the same way that homosexuality was normalized and being made acceptable, okay? So using the same tactics used by gay activists, paedophiles have begun to seek similar status, arguing their desire for children is a sexual orientation no different than heterosexual or homosexuals, okay? So once you begin to accept perversion in society, as normal, you know, you have it on the soaps, it's just normal for people to be gay and it gradually escalates and escalates. Once that's established, then what about the paedophiles? Surely, 
It's not different, you see. It, it, was, it was thought of exactly the same. It was thought of as perversion. In the 1970s, to be homosexual was not accepted in society. The thing that's brought it into acceptance in mainstream is the culture. It's been accepted by the mainstream because it's been on the TV. Now, we'll, we'll, we'll have a look at that in a second. Um, there's a thing called the DSM, which is the way by which psychologists and psychiatrists um, diagnose mental health. Okay, and it used to be that it was a mental health issue if somebody thought that they were gay. They thought that they wanted to sleep with other men because it's not natural, is it? You don't get, you, you don't get any kind of uh, proliferation of the species by men with men. Okay, you're not going to have any offspring men with men. Okay, you'll have offspring men with women. That's what's normal. That's what works. If there's something that's an aberration from that, then we should recognize it as a defect and we should deal with it as such, okay? We think now being gay is more acceptable, but it's only because it's been made more acceptable by the mainstream media. So this, this is how it's happening with paedophilia now, okay? Now it's being made more acceptable. It starts with this, with the uh, DSM, where it's not a mental disorder anymore to uh, want to have sex with children. It is a sexual preference. It's just the way that I am. Okay? And obviously, in the 70s, being gay was thought of as much more serious than it is. Gradually, it gets less and less serious to the point 40 years later, now being gay is just normal. It'll happen the same with paedophilia. If we let, this is what happens when you move away from an objective standard of right and wrong and you let men decide what's right and wrong. People making arguments about what's right and wrong instead of going by what Yehovah says is right. Verse 14 says, If there is a man who marries a woman and her mother, it is immorality. Both he and they shall be burned with fire. Okay, this is how Yehovah sees this, he sees it as so disgusting that this is the penalty for it, okay? Again, it's not about getting a load of people and burning them to death. That's not what Yehovah wants. It's about Yehovah saying, this is my standard of righteousness. Do not go against these things because it is an abomination before me. Don't call yourselves my holy people and do all of these things, okay? This is how serious I think it is. This is how much I don't want you to do it. This is what the penalty will be so that there will be no immorality in your midst. Now, this would probably be thought of as a bit weird in our society if someone was to do this. We've got a story here of a guy in Bangladesh. Okay, i read a little bit at the bottom. It says, as a child in rural Bangladesh, a roller Dalbot, 30, enjoyed growing up with her stepfather, Noten. Her father died when she was small and her mother remarried soon after. Noten was handsome and energetic with curly dark hair and a broad smile. I thought my mother was lucky, Arola says. When we meet in the dusty uh, sunbaked courtyard of her family home in the central forest region of Madhapur, I hoped I'd find a husband like him one day. When she reached puberty, however, Arola learned the truth. She least expected she was already Noten's wife. Okay. In this culture, it's perfectly acceptable. You get the wisdom of men. This is what it ends up with, okay? Deviated away from Yehovah's standard. Verse 15 says, If there is a man who lies with an animal, he shall surely be put to death. You shall also kill the animal. If there is a woman who approaches any animal to mate with it, you shall kill the woman and the animal, they shall surely be put to death. Their blood guiltiness is upon them. Okay? Funnily enough, when Christians say that the law has been done away with, they don't say that bestiality is fine now. They'll say, oh, well, Jesus didn't mention it in the New Testament, so we don't do it. Okay? Doesn't apply to this, though, does it? Jesus never said anything about bestiality. Jesus didn't come along and reiterate everything for everyone, what's already been written in the Holy Scriptures. Okay? This is wrong. This is always going to be wrong. Yehovah sees it as wrong. Jesus doesn't see it any differently than his father sees it. Found this on YouTube. Okay. Wisdom of men. 
Okay, this is a girl. This is a girl giving 10 reasons why it's perfectly acceptable to do this. Why it makes more sense, in fact, to do this. Verse 17 says, If there is a man who takes his sister, his father's daughter, or his mother's daughter, so that he sees her nakedness, and she sees his nakedness, it is a disgrace. And they shall be cut off in the sight of the sons of their people. He has uncovered his, his sister's nakedness, he bears his guilt. Okay, again, we've got an objective standard. I'm sure that you could come up with loads of reasons why this was fine. Oh, they love each other. Okay, the yeah, Elbaz says, not among my people. If there is a man who lies with a menstruous woman and uncovers her nakedness, he has laid bare her flow and she has exposed the flow of her blood. Thus, both of them shall be cut off from among their people. Okay, having sex when people are on their period, okay? Is this acceptable? Okay, I'm sure that some people would say that it was. The Elbar says, it's not. You shall also not uncover the nakedness of your mother's sister or of your father's sister, for such a one has made naked his blood relative, they will bear their guilt. If there is a man who lies with his uncle's wife, he has uncovered his uncle's nakedness, they will bear their sin. Now the punishment for this is interesting because this isn't something that Yehovah says, I want you to institute as a punishment. This is something that he says that he will institute as a punishment. He says, if anyone does this, okay, they will die childless. If there is a man who takes his brother's wife, it is abhorrent. He has uncovered his brother's nakedness. They will be childless, okay? So that we don't end up in a situation like this, people being inbred, okay? There was a point in time where Yehovah didn't say that it was wrong to do this. When he gave his law though, he says his law was added because of transgressions. He says, don't do this. Again, we understand why it's not a good idea to do this. Perhaps those people didn't understand the reason why. They just trusted and obeyed. Another uh, result of inbreeding here, okay? The royal family, they're one of the most inbred families on the earth, okay? Where people of um, what's called the black nobility, the people who've given themselves titles, okay? They like to interbreed. They like to have their bloodlines interbreeding, okay? Not a good idea. Verse 22 says, You are therefore to keep all my statutes and ordinances and do them so that the land which I am bringing, uh, bringing you to live will not spew you out. Okay, this is very good evidence against the people who are living in Israel at the moment. Okay, they have done everything possible that the Torah says will defile the land. They've done it. Yelva says, If you do these things, Call with yourself my people, dwell in my holy land, and you do these things, then the land will spew you out. It will reject you because this is a holy land. You know that Tel Aviv is the LGBT uh, capital of the world. Okay? It's like the capital of debauchery. Okay? Moreover, you shall uh, not follow the customs of the nation which I will drive out before you. For they did all these things, and therefore I have abhorred them. Hence I have said to you, you are to possess their land, and I myself will give it to you to possess, a land flowing with milk and honey. I am Yehovah your God, who has separated you from the peoples. He knows what the people of the world are like. He says, okay, I'll reach my hand out and I'll ask you to be one of my people. But what you've got to do is you've got to separate yourself from the world. I'll offer you this. Okay, he offered them a land flowing with milk and honey where everything would work well, where all of these systems for dealing with the poor people in the land, they all worked to everyone's benefit. And everybody trusted Yehovah, everyone trusted his wisdom, and everything turned out properly. That's the way that it should be, okay? These people that he's speaking to at the moment, they chose not to do that. They chose to walk in a way that did not please him, okay? So he offers them, you can be separate from all people. You can be my holy people. The same offer that he gives to us. We have the same choice as them. 
Do we embrace all of these things? Do we go after all of these things? Have we got a hunger and a desire to do all of these things and then make ourselves the holy people of Yehovah? Or do we just intermingle with the people around us so that we don't really look any different? We might say, well, you know, I believe in God. Maybe that looks a bit weird to the people around us. Yehovah says that you will be hated amongst the world. If you are my people, the world will hate you. Okay? People might think, well, you know, if I walk like Yeshua walked, everyone's going to love me. Okay? Let's not forget what they did to Yeshua, how he ended up. It's not about looking a little bit weird to the world because we believe in God. Okay? It is about being so qualitatively different that the world hates us because the way that we act testifies against them. It testifies against the evil things that they do because we reject them. So the world ends up turning around and hating us in return. Okay? That's the people that we've been called to be. You are therefore to make a distinction. Sorry. Exactly, exactly. But it's not just being a bit odd. It's being completely opposed to everything of the world. You are therefore to make a distinction between the clean animal and the unclean, and between the unclean bird and the clean. And you shall make yourselves, okay, in the Hebrew, it says your souls, okay, you shall, make your, you shall not make your souls detestable by animal or by bird. Do you think that eating unclean animals used to make your soul detestable? But now it doesn't since Jesus has come, okay? It doesn't make any sense, does it? Okay, and that, yet that is a lie that is sold in churches which I have separated for you as unclean, okay? We're his holy people, we're separate from the world. We eat the diet of his holy set-apart people. He set apart these animals which we are to use as food. We looked at the science of why it's wise to eat clean animals anyway. But he says, don't make your souls detestable by doing these things. Thus you are to be holy to me, for I am Yehovah, for I Yehovah am holy, and I have set you apart from the peoples to be mine. This is really important. Okay? He makes us holy so that we will be his. We can't say we are his unless we are set apart from the people around us. It doesn't work like that. We can't have both things. We can't say, yeah, I'm Yehovah's. Um, definitely his i love him and yet i want all of these things i put all of these things above who yahuwah is okay i choose these things basically because it shows our heart we talk with our lips about loving god he sees our heart I and mean, whether we actually do these things whether we actually love them now a man or a woman who is a medium or spiritist shall surely be put to death they shall be stoned with stones their blood guiltiness is upon them and that's the end of the torah portion but a verse that I think is particularly relevant to what we've looked at today is this one, okay? Because the land is full of churches that do this, okay? Woe unto them that call evil good, okay? He says, you make your souls abominable before me. You make them detestable by eating unclean animals. And yet the churches will teach you eating unclean animals is fine, okay? And good, evil, Churches around the country, they'll tell you that keeping the Torah is wrong. Keeping the Torah is legalism, it's bondage, okay? It's not returning to Yehovah's ways. And what it comes from is something deep within people, some deep-seated spiritual issue where they are in rebellion to God's word, okay? So woe unto the churches in this country is basically what this is saying. They put darkness for light and light for darkness. They put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. All of these terms, okay, evil, good, light, darkness, bitter, sweet, it's all terms that are used throughout Scripture to describe keeping the Torah, not keeping the Torah. So basically what it's saying is, woe unto them who don't keep the Torah to sum it up. Okay, shall we pray?